Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA a certification training course on operating system security issues. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to go through our requirements from the 22702, that's our practical application exam, section 4.2, where we're going to look at security and operating systems, local users, local groups, user account control, share permissions, files versus folders. We'll also look a little bit about BIOS security on your systems as well. Every Windows device has a number of local users and groups that are configured inside of it. And these are a number that are created by default when you load the operating system. And of course, you could add new users and groups to your system as well. Now, a couple of important ones you should keep in mind. One is the administrator user. This is the user that has complete rights and access to anything going on on your computer. This user is able to install programs. This user is able to delete other usernames and change people's passwords to be able to have access to all of the files that are on your computer. That particular administrative user, pretty important. And one of the things in Vista, this is my Vista computer management screen, you'll notice that administrator user is not enabled by default. There's also a guest user that can give people limited access to your computer. That one also disabled by default. These are security concerns. So it's nice that nobody can log in unless we administratively go in and allow people to log in with that name. And the other users on your computer are the regular users, the ones that are normally the people logging into your computer and accessing their particular resources on that device. There are also groups on your computer. And one particular group you should always know about is the power users group. This particular group sounds like it has a lot of power. It does a lot of things. In reality, it doesn't have much more control than a regular user. It has some administrative capabilities. So if there's someone on a machine that needs to be able to do things like schedule tasks, that be able to perform backups and things like that sort, that particular username will give them access. That group grants them that access for that particular user to be able to do those things. In Windows Vista, Microsoft introduced this user account control, or what we abbreviate as UAC. And it's where you are running normally as a standard user on your computer. But there may be times when you need elevated access to be able to perform a particular function. This was really put in so that things like spyware and malware wouldn't have complete access to everything running on your system. You could run as a regular user instead of running as administrator all the time, which is what many people were doing. What this does is allow me to run normally, but anytime something that needs that elevated access occurs, it prompts you, it pops up a message and says, Windows needs your permission to continue. So can, can we do this, please? Click a button to continue or not to continue. That way, if you're sitting there and all of a sudden your computer says, I need access to modify the firewall, and you haven't asked to modify the firewall, you can stop that before the bad program tries to take over your system. Maybe install applications, or schedule tasks, or change user information. You can only do that if you've given permission via UAC. Now, you can change some of those things. Maybe you don't want to be prompted every time somebody tries to schedule a task. You can always go into your local security policy console and modify that specific function so that it will never prompt you again via UAC. Determining rights and permissions to certain files and folders on your computer can sometimes be a challenge. But if you follow a couple of simple rules, you'll most of the time be able to figure out where all of these rights and permissions are coming from. We have different kinds of permissions on a Windows machine. One set of permissions is an NTFS set of permissions. These, these are the permissions assigned to somebody because the operating system's file system is allowing them access to this file. The file system says that a particular user might have full control or modify or read and execute rights to a particular folder or a particular file. NTFS is very good about doing that. And of course, that works for everybody who might be local on that machine. If you're connecting through the network, there's another additional set of permissions you need to consider. Those are called share permissions. Since we're sharing that folder, the share permissions only, the, you can see some of these permissions, full control, change, and read are some of the basic functions there. Now, the, the determination of what your total set of rights may be is going to be a combination of these things. Even if the share permission allows full control for you, the NTFS permission may deny certain pieces. And it's a combination of those things working together that give you your effective permissions. 
Here are some of these things you should keep in mind. The NTFS permissions apply to local and network connections. Your share permissions, since people are connecting from the network to access those, they only apply to people connecting over the network. So if you're trying to figure out the permissions for somebody who's on a local machine, just don't even consider the share permissions. Those are only for people connecting over the network. The most restrictive setting wins. So at any time, if something is denied to you, it's denied. Even if there's something that explicitly allows that, that's too bad. Somewhere else, the restrictive setting wins. So you always keep that in mind. If at any point there is a deny, then it's absolutely denied. There's really no question about that. Also keep in mind that the permissions for a folder or a file are inherited from the parent object. So you can look at the previous folder and then the previous folder up the way on the tree. Now, if you take and you move a folder to somewhere else on the same volume, the rights and permissions that it had originally follow it. Because when you move something like an entire folder on the same drive, it's really just moving a pointer. And so the parent permissions don't necessarily correlate now to what the moved folder has. So you have to keep that in mind. Sometimes you have to go to that exact folder and look at their permissions to really get an understanding of exactly what people are going to have in that. Don't trust that the parent folder is going to be exactly the same as some folders underneath it. If you're ever looking at a file or a folder and you're trying to figure out for a particular user, what kind of rights and permissions do they have here? If you take all of these things into account, what is their effective set of permissions for that particular user? There's a capability in Windows that allows you to see that. You can take a file or a folder, look at its properties, and go to the Security tab. On the Security tab is an Advanced button. And the Advanced button gives you a bunch of advanced security settings for reports. And one of those tabs is the Effective Permissions tab. And here you can put in for the object, this happens to be the Reports folder, you can put in a username or a group here. And it will tell you what those effective permissions might be for that person. So let's select somebody. I'm going to type in uh, part of my name here and do a check names. It doesn't know that name. Let's try typing it all the way out. And you'll notice now it finds me. And it says, yes, there's a user called permissions here, or the user called professor here. Let's check the permissions. I'll click OK. Puts my name up there. And now I've got the effective permissions that I have on this machine. I'm the administrator, so it's telling me that that particular user absolutely has access to those things. Let's select another name here. I'm going to go into Advanced, and I'm going to do a search for everything. And let's pick up a group. Let's say the guest user. That's actually a better one instead of a group. Let's take that user and choose that one. Notice the, the user guest has none of those rights and permissions to the reports folder. So using that effective permissions capability can tell me exactly what I would expect to see if I was that user trying to access that resource on this computer. Not only are there some default users and groups installed on a computer, there are also a set of administrative shares that are created by default as well. They're hidden shares, which means they have a dollar sign right after them, but they are on your machine. If you go to your machine and you type in net share at a prompt, it will show you all of these different shares that are on there. This machine has a C, colon, C dollar for my C colon backslash, my root directory, which is the default share. There's a remote IPC share that is used for Windows. There is an in share. I have an in drive on this computer. That's where that's coming from. And an admin for my C colon Windows directory for remote administration into Windows. So looking at all of those together, you can see a number of those shares are available. And if I have the right permissions to log in as administrator on this machine, then I can access those shares across the network. The Windows operating system has a few ways that it can encrypt data on our computer so that no one else can see it. One of those ways is through something called EFS, which stands for Encrypting File System. And it's something that's available if we're running the NTFS system on our, on our disk. So that directory system allows us to encrypt files and directories that might be on our hard drive. And if we right mouse click on a folder or a file, you'll have some advanced attributes. And you can simply click a checkbox, and it will encrypt those contents to secure the data. There's another process behind the scenes that allows us to back up the certificates that are used for this encryption process just in case we happen to lose this particular hard drive, something happens to it, we can recover from a backup and use our certificate to at least gain access back to these. Otherwise, we'll encrypt this data and we won't have access to it any longer. 
Some people prefer to encrypt an entire drive. And Windows has a capability in Windows Vista Enterprise and Windows Vista Ultimate to be able to encrypt entire volumes. I see people do this a lot with portable systems or even with USB keys. And that's a functionality called BitLocker. It uses, again, a set of encryption algorithms to be able to do that. And it stores the encryption keys in a chip that's on the computer called the Trusted Platform Module Chip that's specifically designed for these types of security tasks. Individual files on our operating system may also have attributes associated with them. We can go into files and set them up to be read-only so that nobody can change them regardless of what the other permissions might be on this computer. We can hide them with a hidden button. You can check that. And the file is now hidden. And unless you specifically tell your operating system to show me the hidden files, nobody else will be able to see that file. There's also a file system on here, a file attribute on here that tells me that the file is ready for archiving. It sets a bit so that your backup system knows that this file is available now to be backed up. And so if you're doing a differential backup and it's looking to see what it hasn't backed up lately, you can set a bit that enables that particular file to be ready and available should the backup system come along. And the last one is a system attribute. The system attribute is used to designate system files on your computer. Normally, you don't manually set any files that way. Your operating system handles all of that for you automatically. Not only do we have security in our operating system working for us, we also have security built into the basic input-output system of your computer, the BIOS itself. Uh, one of the capabilities is a lock that you can enable within the BIOS. You can enable and disable certain drives or certain ports. If you wanted to make it so that nobody could use a floppy drive or a CD-ROM or DVD-ROM or writer on your machine, you can enable it and disable it from the BIOS. Some organizations will disable the USB option there, so nobody could plug in a USB key into their computer either. Another thing that you can do is add passwords to it. There are a couple of different kinds of passwords. There is usually a user password that is first prompted when you start your machine, and you have to have that password just to start the operating system. There's often also a supervisor password, which means if you wanted to go to the BIOS and make changes to any of these things, you must also know the supervisor password. And lastly, there's a relatively new capability in a number of BIOSes I've seen called intrusion detection. There's a sensor that's on the case itself. And if somebody was to open that case and then put the case back on again and you started your computer, your BIOS would pop a message up that said, this machine has been tampered with. You may want to check this machine, make sure nothing is missing or that nothing has been added and that everything's ex exactly what you're expecting because somebody did open the top of this case up. Let's review some of these topics from our operating system security issues. Our first question is, how can you change which processes are managed with user account control? Well, we can decide exactly what things we're going to ask about UAC and not ask about UAC in the local security policy console. Our next question is, which encryption technology can encrypt entire volumes, not just individual files and folder, but the entire volume itself? And that would be BitLocker. And the last question is, where are these encryption keys stored that are used for things like BitLocker? Well, on most machines that support this, they're put in the Trusted Platform Module chip, or what we call the TPM chip. That covers our requirements from our 227.02 Section 4.2, where we've gone through operating system security and BIOS security. You can always visit our website to look at any of our absolutely free videos, participate in our message boards, or much more. You can visit us at freeaplus.com.